let's try to develop this equation and see what kind of oh here I forgot to write the psi right perhaps we can put the psi out so that everything is included in that bracket <coughs> Now let's discuss the meaning of psi in this new context. What is psi? We have started with the first degree time derivatives. What we have at the back of our mind is that we d by dt, that is first degree time derivatives, was associated with the fact that we want something like psi star psi as the probability density. As in the previous case, non-relativistic case, a positive definite probability density. Now, which satisfies together with the rho dt plus that continuity equation. Why? If that is really the probability density, the total probability should be 1, because we have a theory of beautiful theory of probability, the discipline of mathematics. It has own structure, on own axioms. It's, it, it, we want to establish contact with that <coughs> field of mathematics. It should be that, so that positive definiteness is guaranteed, and together with that continuity equation, so that total probability is conserved, independent of time. Now looking at this expression, d by dt and divergence of j. If you remember this expression, d by dx mu, d by dc, dc ct, then we see that that equation is like, although eventually I will prove that, it is like something like this. Well, tentatively, let's put that question mark to be, uh, be, to be verified and made to be, how do you say, to be put on a solid ground at a later stage, but this, this equation has that form. It is like the four conservation, the conservation of a four current. d by dt is there, divergence, ordinary divergence is there, and you, you see there are the components of this, space component and time component of this. If so, what is the physical, uh, physical inference I get from here? Rho cannot be a scalar. Scalar is invariant, right? A number. It, 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 it doesn't change under transformation. That's the definition of scalar. Why do I say so? Because if this is like a four current conservation, it must be the zeroth component of a four vector, not a scalar. It should be rather <coughs> it should rather be the zeroth component of f4 vector. I, I want you to understand this well, because this is really the starting point. Cannot be a scalar, must be the zeroth component of a 4 vector. If Rho is not a scalar, that is psi star psi, then psi cannot be a scalar, because if you have the scalar as is complex conjugate, you multiply it, it becomes a scalar. Therefore, psi cannot be a scalar.
Well, that follows from here. That's one thing. Second, well, at least I have decided what it cannot be. But what is it really? Let's postpone that. We have understood that it cannot be a scalar. Next question is, this was the first question. The second question, what are alpha 1, 2, 3 and beta? The first answer which comes to your mind, well, they are constants in the first place. Are those constants C numbers? Ordinary numbers? Are they C numbers? If so, let's see what kind of difficulty it leads to. Suppose they are. Look at the equation. If there are numbers, forget about the left hand side now. If you rotate the space among themselves, pure space rotations, then, then under pure space rotations, that is mixing x1, x2, x3 only, not touching the time, you know, the space rotation, it mixes them. Then right hand side cannot be invariant because they are number times d by dx1, number times dx, dx2, so you cannot guarantee the invariance of the right hand side. The right hand side would not be invariant cannot be made invariant, even with the compensation factor of the psi, would not be invariant. So they are not pure numbers. Psi is not pure scalar. So let's after these negation, that is, that we have decided what they are not, let's see what they would be, what they could be in principle. So what are they? If they are not those, nuts are important in here. So what are they? so that I can bypass those vetoes on concerning the invar pure invariance, etc., of the space, invariance under the space rotations, etc. Now, I propose that psi could be a column matrix. Let's start with that, because the question one is on the psi, the question two or are on the alphas and betas. Propose psi is a column matrix N cross one column that is Now propose proposal two. Then looking at the equation in the left hand side d by dt of psi.
in the right hand side there is also this overall psi 1 to psi n then in order to get mathematical consistency then these should be n by n matrices R to be n by n matrices question any matrices or a restricted class of matrices Hermitian matrices why remember h power over i d by dx1 h power over i d by dx2 and there's a c real number there's in the in the front alpha 1 and this is like h Hamiltonian times psi Hamiltonian should be Hermitian therefore if it is momentum 1 times alpha 1 alpha 1 should be Hermitian too and so is so all of them are Hermitian matrices not real obviously Hermitian matrices well that's it you see how simply we have elevated from a simple scalar function pure numbers framework to a framework of matrices so in this sense the equation then becomes the following i h bar d psi r d t I put an additional label r this is the label of the position of the psi psi 1 psi 2 etc it carries now additional index as it is a, a spinner times h r s psi s if you want put that summation sign to you know my picture is indicating what I'm talking about the new index is r12 capital N this is rs matrix and times s is the labeling the position in the second so obviously it's a matrix multiplication thus there must be a summation so what is the form of this Hamiltonian now the Hamiltonian is IHRS is <clears throat> now let's put in the e momentum operators if you want or just key, keep them as d by dx it's up to you h bar c over i sum over i alpha i r s d by dx i so I'm just using the matrix label for the matrices on the RS alpha I matrices plus M C squared beta R S so I have four Hermitian matrices alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha 3 and beta therefore the Hamiltonian is Hermitian it's guaranteed and instead of pure numbers they are matrices and psi is a column matrix now the next task is to determine these alpha beta matrices and the psi itself and the dimension so there are several difficult tasks in front of us so there are questions what is an obviously that's the most important and n is the dimension of the spinner you are well the dimension of this column uh, matrix I reveal the secret saying spinner there is a profound thing we are facing in here already at the non-relativistic quantum mechanics when we were incorporating the relativistic effects at the atomic level because of the largeness of the average electrons speed inside the atom alpha times the C we have seen that 
we are forced to incorporate the spin into the game. When there was relativity opening up to the relativistic regime, we were forced to bring in the spin, like the spin orbit, obviously. The most characteristic of the presence of the spin or the interrelationship between spin and relativity was the spin orbit. It was a rather semi-classical type of argument, but you'll see at the end of next week that we are going to have all those things coming from the Dirac's theory, which marries relativity and quantum mechanics. So what is the n? If n is not one, if it is one, two or four or eight, obviously this is a spinorial structure, and you are familiar with this kind of wave function from non-relative to quantum mechanics. If you have a spinning object, spin one half, then its wave function is two-dimensional. You know that this dimensionality in the wave function is associated with the spin. So probably when we are moving into relativity, we are getting something spinful, something carrying spin. And you may say that's the reason why probably we rejected the spinless phi. The Klein-Gordon equation represents spinless object. We rejected it because it didn't carry any spin. Spin and relativity, think about it on your own. There's beautiful philosophical speculation, room for speculations that even at your level. Huh? That's nice, I guess. So what is the N? And what are the explicit expressions of alpha i and beta? So these are the next next tasks that we have to follow. There are two things which we have to be always check against. One is the continuity equation. Well, it is already implicitly used by choosing the first derivative for time and first derivative for the space. So that's already incorporated. The second thing, which is physically more vital to incorporate is the energy momentum dispersion relation. So this, we have to ensure the consistency of this equation with the energy momentum dispersion relation. We should ensure the consistency consistency of the new equation with this relationship. You say, what do I mean by the consistency with that relation? Well, consistency with that relation takes us back to the previous hour that we, when we were play, playing with the Klein-Gordon equation. So what we have to now do is obtain that equation again, take that energy momentum dispersion relation in the operator form, and apply it to an arbitrary function of space and time, get an equation, put that equation at one side, and try to get from this new equation something of higher order so that we can compare the two equations. That's the consistency. Okay. So let me keep my promise and get the equation which is obtained from that. What is it? Minus h bar squared. d squared dt squared. Psi. Psi is now an arbitrary thing. You can think that the same psi you are using there, if, if it is arbitrary, is equal to minus h bar squared c squared del squared plus m squared c to the fourth psi. Here is the equation I obtained from this by replacing h and p with the associated operators and acting on an arbitrary function of space and time. This is the equation sitting in here. 
I would like to compare these two equations. But obviously, in order to compare these two, I have to go to one degree high from there. Remember, it was a big deal to get the square root equation. Now I'm, from, I'm starting from that correct square root equation and square it and compare against this. So what I'm going to do is square this and compare. Isn't that nice? So simple reasonings and compare against this one. I hope you understand this. Okay, let me take the square of the new equation. Now we can now call it Dirac equation, although this is not finished yet, because this is the Dirac's approach anyway. So let's get the, the equation and try to square it. And you know, these, these terminology are rather, uh, how do you say, interesting terminologies. You have to really define how do you square the equation. Okay, what is the equation? Now let me drop the indices. I don't need them yet. That's a spinorial indices I dropped. H bar C over I, sum over I, alpha I D by D X I, plus MC squared beta times psi is my equation. Squaring this means let me act on it by IH part B by DT once more. That's the, that's the terminology. Squaring means to get this expression. To get that expression, I have to act on the original equation by IH part D by DT once more. Obviously, it's going to lead to the desired form. So what is the left-hand side? Left-hand side is H bar squared D squared DT psi, sorry. What about the right-hand side? Well, although it is sort of stupid to do it in two steps, let me do it. Well, I have put the derivative in here. This is the operator here. D by dx, constant. This is d by dt. Jumps over. Jumped over. And use the original equation. Original equation is this. The square of that of that is h bar c over i sum over i alpha i d by d x i plus m c squared beta times <coughs> h bar c over i sum over j alpha j d by d x j you understand why i have used i in here and j in there they are dummy summation indices. They have to be different indices. Plus m c squared beta times psi. So that's my right hand side. Left hand side is obviously exactly the same as the energy momentum dispersion equation. In the right hand side, I have to do this some multiplication. It's a difficult multiplication, but let me do it. What is it? <coughs> Minus h bar squared c squared sum over i and j alpha i alpha j d dx i d dx j first term with the first term it looks horrendous but simply multiply i'm not uh, no big deal really Provided that we use different indices, so that there is nothing, no, not, nothing which confuses us. Plus the second, with the second, m squared c to the four beta squared. Plus with first with the second, second with the first, the cross terms. So cross terms are h bar m c cube h bar divided by r sum i 
alpha i beta plus beta alpha i times d by dx i. That is the right hand side now. Left hand sides are exactly the same. If these two equations are to be consistent, the right hand side of this equation should be the same as the right hand side of that energy momentum dispersion relation equation. First of all, notice that there is the m squared c to the fourth term times beta squared. That beta squared should be 1 in order to be the same as that one. There is no first derivative term in here. There are the second derivatives and constants. So that first derivative terms, cross term, should be 0. In order to make this 0, this should be equal to 0. And finally, these terms, the second derivative term should be the same as the second derivative terms. But notice that I need to carry out a further manipulation in there. How do I do that? This is the product of two arbitrary matrices. Let me consider this product of two arbitrary matrices and write it as the sum of symmetric and antisymmetric combinations. How do I do that? I first of all do this elementary school algebra. 1 is equal to 1 half plus 1 half. Then I add and subtract the opposite. I wish I had different color, I don't. So. A trivial statement, isn't it? I have written 1 equals 1 half plus 1 half, and then taken the, the opposite product, j and i, j, i, j, j, i, j, i, that's 0. I added 0, essentially. And what is this? 1 half the anti-commutator that is the sum, AB plus BA. One half commutator alpha I alpha J, AB minus BA. Beautiful, isn't it? The product of any two matrices can be written as the uh, commutators, sum of the commutators and anti-commutators, time one half, obviously. But this is symmetric, isn't it? symmetrical in ij, right? And that's anti-symmetrical. So, but this one is symmetrical, isn't it? The xi, the xj, x and j, xi and xj are real things. d by the xi, d by the xj, the x1, the x2. You can take the any order. But this is symmetrical. So what do I have? I have the product of this times a symmetrical combination, but this contains a symmetrical and anti-symmetrical one. An anti-symmetrical one times a symmetrical one summed over all indices is zero, as you can immediately demonstrate in two minutes or half a minute, some of you. That's the ordinary matrix algebra. So only the first one, the symmetrical one, survives. This survives only. The other vanishes. So the first term is really minus h bar squared c squared times alpha i, I j summation, one half alpha i alpha j anti commutator times that. 
In order this now, with this new form, to be equal to that one, del squared is d, d by dx1 squared, d by dx2 squared, d by dx2, 3 squared. But this has all the combination, x1 squared, x2 squared, x3 squared, x1, x2, x1, x3, x2, x3. We want to get rid of those mixed things. So we say this coefficient in here, which is 1 half alpha i alpha j, should be delta ij. If I set equal to delta ij, times dx i dx j, it gives me, because, I'm sorry for those of you who think this is stupidly trivial, d, dx i dx j is equal to this. That's why I want that to be equal to that one. Okay. So where do we, where are we now? We have the properties of alpha i beta. We have the, they are Hermitian, a key to satisfy they all satisfy the algebra. Beta squared equals 1. Alpha i, alpha j equals twice delta ij. Alpha i, beta is equal to 0. They are Hermitian, they satisfy this algebra. What do they lead to further? Now, I will show further that they are uh, uh, they are uh, traceless. Three. Alpha i and beta are traceless. Furthermore, They are, they have, their eigenvalues are plus minus one. So let me demonstrate these properties. Their Hermitian, that's given. They satisfy this algebra, we have deduced that. We, we take by, by using the consistency with the energy moment dispersion relation. Now we have to next demonstrate that they are traceless, that is trace of these four matrices are zero and their eigenvalues are plus minus one. Also demonstrating the eigenvalues plus minus one is easy because if I now take, the, take this one and take of i equals j case, what do I have? Alpha i squared is 1. So not only the beta squared is the identity matrix, alpha i squared for any three i, alpha 1 squared is identity matrix, alpha 2 squared is identity matrix, alpha 3 squared is identity matrix. That's together with this. This was already there. So these algebraic relations it will ensure that their eigenvalues are plus minus one. Let's demonstrate that. Define the eigenvalue equation, say, we start with the beta. Beta on phi beta, that's the eigenfunction, is equal to lambda beta phi beta, that's the typical eigenvalue equation, isn't it? So what do I do? I multiply this with beta once more. So I have in the left hand side beta squared phi beta, lambda beta times beta phi beta. Beta phi beta is again going back to the original equation, lambda b phi beta. So this is 
lambda beta squared phi beta. Now let me use the relation. Our beta squared is 1. This is a very nice and standard derivation of the so-called eigenpotent operators. Those operators whose squares are 1, you can compute eigenvalues using this method. Now, this and that gives you lambda beta squared minus 1 times phi beta is equal to 0. For non-trivial phi beta, you have to have this one is equal to 0. So lambda beta is plus minus 1. I don't think there's a need for demonstrating this, repeating that demonstration for the 3 alpha. There it follows exactly the same. All you have to do is replace this beta phi beta is alpha i phi alpha i for, and repeat it the same. So you see that their eigenvalues are plus minus 1. So this one is demonstrated. Well, let's demonstrate the third one, that their traces are equal to zero. Okay. Their traces are equal to zero. Let me take this equation. for all 3 alpha. Let me multiply this with beta. So what do I have? Beta alpha i beta plus beta squared alpha i is equal to 0. Beta squared is equal to 1. So this I can determine alpha i is equal to minus beta alpha i beta. So it gives me this equation. For any i, i is 1, 2, and 3. Take trace. Of both sides. Trace alpha i is equal to minus trace beta alpha i beta. I will use, use the famous trace identity trace AB is equal to trace BA, right? You can demonstrate this if you want. That's a trivial statement. Use this as A, this as B, and AB is this. BA is alpha IB times beta. Beta squared is 1. So I have trace alpha I is equal to minus trace alpha I beta squared jumped over. Use the fact that beta squared is identity, so it is minus trace of alpha i. Trace alpha i is equal to minus itself. How do you solve this equation? Twice trace alpha is equal to trace, all trace alpha is equal to zero, right? I'm not going to repeat the proof for the other case, for the beta, because this time you multiply this for, now this time I have to warn you, there will be no re repetition or sum over repeated indices. There is no sum over repeated indices, correcting the English first. So if I multiply this with alpha i for any i, 1, 2, or 3, then you get beta is equal to minus alpha i times beta alpha i. Then you use the same argument to demonstrate that trace beta is equal to 0. So we have traceless, we have Hermitian and traceless alpha i and beta matrices. They have eigenvalues equal to plus and minus 1. And furthermore, they satisfy this algebra here. 
How do I determine them now? So, let me go back to hermeticity. Her mission can be diagonalized, this is a general theorem of linear algebra theory, can be diagonalized, all of them. Via similarity transformations. If you want to refresh your memory, read a little bit of linear algebra theory. Hermitian matrices can be diagonalized using similarity transformations. You can even construct those similarity transformations. A beautiful, simple exercise, really. What are the diagonal elements? Diagonal elements are the eigenvalues Okay. Theory of linear algebra. I'm using that, borrowing that theorem from there. Now what is the trace? Trace is invariant under similarity transformation. Thus, trace of diagonal matrices are also zero. I started with the alpha I beta, made a similarity transformation, diagonalized them, and the trace is invariant. Trace of diagonal matrices are also zero. Trace Sum of eigenvalues is equal to zero. Sum of the plus ones and minus ones, isn't it? Eigenvalues are plus one and minus one. So I have plus ones and minus ones added up to zero. If I have two plus one and minus one, one minus one, I get plus one. If I have one plus one, two minus one, I get one minus one. So I need to have equal number of plus ones and minus ones. Okay, if you are coming there. Equal numbers of plus ones and minus ones. How can I have equal, equal number of plus ones and minus ones? I need to have an even. Beautiful. So ends are zero, two, four, six. That's the only possible values of n. Ruled out. Single psi. Scalar function. Psi star psi. Scalar. It's not the zeroth component of a four vector. Ruled out. On, based on the continuity equation. Next in line is this. And then this. And then we have to go hand in one by one. Let's check the n equals 2 case. Two-dimensional wave function, two-dimensional spinners, two by two matrices, right? The space uh, alphas and betas are two by two matrices. What are the known two by two Hermitian matrices in hand? N equals two. Pauli spin. And what are the linearly independent set of operators? Sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, and the identity, two-dimensional identity. How many matrices? 
three plus one identity. How many do I have? Alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, beta, and the four identity. There are one more matrices. I cannot identify them with the sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. It doesn't fit into that space. I have one more operator which I have to find a place and there is no room. Any matrix in this space can be written as a linear superposition of three sigmas and one identity. And I have four. Does not fit. So I have to go up. Now that's Eureka, it works. So I have a four dimensional spin or space. Four by four Hermitian traceless matrices. How do I determine them? Enough. We have enough information in hand. They're, they satisfy that algebra, they are Hermitian, they are traceless, and their dimension is four by four. So what I have to do is form, parameterize these four matrices, which are four by four themselves, with arbitrary Hermitian, how do you parameterize Hermitian matrix? The diagonal elements are real, off-diagonal elements are complex conjugate of each other, etc. Then you substitute them in the algebraic equations, that set of algebra, and determine all those unknown parameters you have, you have loaded in. You solve them, and you get the following representation. That is the end of the story. Notice that I have used two by two sub blocks so that sigma's ordinary polys appear. Alpha i is this, Hermitian obviously, and beta is this, their squares are one, they anti-commute among themselves, and they are traceless. Finished. We have really constructed the Dirac theory. You see, we are moving rather fast, and it's a beautiful theory, and it's really correct now. Relativist quantum mechanics, consistent with the continuity equation, have positive definite probability density, the correct probability current, we'll see. And there are so many beautiful surprises, and I'm sure you are going to enjoy it. It is a beautiful game, really, this relativistic quantum mechanics.